All right, welcome everyone uh, to our third Sea Otter webinar, series of three Sea Otter webinars um, done by Sea Otter Savvy, CDFW. And today's a really special one. Um, we are doing an advanced Q&A um, and it's kind of in a panel form. Um, so we've got Heather Barrett, who if you've attended um, the previous two webinars you should remember. Uh, Heather joined the Monterey Bay Aquarium Sea Otter Research and Conservation Program while at UC Santa Cruz. After receiving her Bachelor of Science, Heather worked with California Department of Fish and Wildlife and continued to assist with a variety of programs, including whale shark risk, uh, research in Mexico, a Belizean field study, and a variety of outdoor education programs. She recently graduated from Moss Landing Marine Laboratories Congratulations, where she uh, investigated the energetic cost of human disturbance to sea otters, and it is currently uh, and is, she is currently the science communication director and research scientist for Sea Otter Savvy. Uh, on our panel, we also have Mike Harris. Uh, Mike Harris is a senior environmental scientist and lead sea otter biologist for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Since 1991, Mike has been part of a collaborative team of scientists monitoring the California sea otter population and conducting research on marine ecosystem health and sea otter conservation and management issues. And our third person on our panel is Jenna Bentel. Uh, Jenna worked as a sea otter biologist, um, has worked as a sea otter biologist since 2001, studying sea otters in such wide ranging locations as the Aleutian Islands, the uh, Russia's Commodore Commander Islands and San Nicolas Island off the coast of Southern California. And she founded the Sea Otter Savvy program in 2015 with the goal to reduce human caused disturbance to sea otters and increase awareness about this unique species. Um, so with that, um, we are going to have um, each panelist um, speak and then after um, each um, speaker is done, we'll uh, bring up questions. So there's that Q&A box, if um, this is your first webinar, there's that Q&A box down below. So feel free to utilize that because after each um, person is done speaking, you'll be able to ask questions um, for that person or for the whole panel because it's a, a panel Q&A. So with that, I will pass it off to Heather Barrett. Thank you, Robin. Hi, everyone. It's exciting to be back again for the third time. Um, and I'm going to start off with just kind of mentioning again that there's a bit of an overview. So we're going to break this down into sort of three different categories. Um, I'll be speaking first, then Mike, and then Jenna. And so after each of these um, segments, we actually have some pre-recorded uh, questions that we received. So we'll go over those, and then we're going to open it up to the open questions. Um, and all three of us will be available. Um, and so once we reach that slide, I'll let everyone know, and we'll come up on the screen, and you can see us. And um, we're excited to answer all of your questions today. Um, but for the first one, the first segment we're going to go into is population dynamics and talk a little bit about range. And so I wanted, I know that you guys have seen maps of California before in the first and second weeks, but I wanted to go again and show the current range um, of the Southern Sea Otter. And so you can see this, it's between those two red stars. And ultimately it, it, it's approximately 375 miles of coastal range. And there are approximately 3000 animals in the Southern Sea Otter population. And the one thing I really wanna point out is that recovery of the species is geographically limited, okay? So range expansion, is important for population recovery and it, it's needed for true sustained recovery. Um, and for sea otters, that's really, the only way they can really go is north or south, right? So out to the left is just ocean and out to the right is just a mountain. So it's really north or south for sea otters. And then here in between those black lines, that is what we're calling range center. Um, and so this is the area that has been established by sea otters the longest. And they are at, high, at higher densities in this location. And as a result, they end up competing um, with each other for food. And so at range center, that balance between energy in, right, feeding yourself, as well as the energy out, all the different activities that you have to do is really at its most precarious, okay? And so now I wanna show you guys some of the latest news and some of the population trends that we see. So in this figure, we have the trends in abundance of sea otters in California. And remember, this is based on a three year running average of raw counts. And so for 2019, that total was 2,962. And so data is shown for all sea otters in solid lines and independence, which basically means um, individuals without pups in dashed lines for the mainland range in blue. 
And then San Nicolas Island is, you see, in brown, or that sort of rusty color. And for the entire range, after 2012, you can see this solid black line. And that's when the counts, um, they were combined to create the official index of relative abundance. And we can see that there's a little bit of a spike after 2015, followed by a slight decline. And um, there are likely some factors that had drove this peak in numbers, but I wanna take a break down of the numbers and look at it a different way before we address this. And so I wanna look at how abundance corresponds a little bit to region. So if I move forward, there we go. Um, now this figure is showing sea otter abundance by region, okay? So north, which is Pigeon Point to Seaside is in blue. Central is in orange and that's Seaside to Cayucas. South is in green, Cayucas to Gaviota and San Nicolas Island is that in brown. And so here we can clearly see that that central region has the highest density, right? So it's above all the others. And we can distinguish that same uh, spike and a little bit of a decline in that central region. So now for the other regions, they don't necessarily appear to have that same spike as the central region. So one of the factors to consider that may be influencing this is prey availability, right? And, and what are the resource limitations? So there are theories that it could be an increase in urchin and mussel availability in that period of time due to the absence of sunflower stars. Um, sunflower stars were greatly impacted by sea star wasting disease. Um, but then you can also think that with a denser population of otters, um, there is also more competition, right? So there's potential for prey limitation. And so all of these complex concepts regarding uh, foraging ecology, Jenna's gonna be going into much more detail in her segment, but I just wanna touch on that and everyone to recognize that when we look at these numbers on graphs like this, they're potentially influenced by many different things, biological, physical, geographical, and all of those are different components to consider. Um, so they need to be considered when discussing population status. And so then this one, this slide, I wanted to show you guys some numbers that maybe um, everyone, this area you are very familiar with, so Morro Bay Harbor. And so the numbers of sea otters regularly inhabiting the waters inside Morro Harbor, we can see how significantly increased over the last decade. So we have sea otter abundance across years, and we can see that during the 1990s through the 2010, the number of otters inside the bay <clears throat> were generally below 10. So it's sort of in the single digits. And then in the early 1980s, this was mainly male spotted. And I want you guys to keep in mind that survey methods did change during this period of time. So that's always can to be considered as a factor as well. Um, because sometimes aerial surveys are more difficult to see certain individuals, depending on how much time you have to fly over, weather, all of that. But since 2010, the numbers have increased with the 2019 survey, um, the final count was 43 otters inside the protected waters of the harbor. And it's also important to note that this count within the bay, you know, it doesn't necessarily reflect population growth, okay? So it could be due to local recruitment, right? There could be shifting of habitat use coming into the bay. So again, I want to emphasize that population status, it's quite complex. So we can look at these numbers, but there's many other things that could be going on. And so I want to kind of get to the, brings me to the fact that in, in 2016, 2017 and 2018, um, sea otter numbers were significant in that they marked three consecutive years where that average population index we talked about exceeded over 3,090, which was a condition for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's um, Southern Sea Otter Recovery Plan uh, to consider sea otters for delisting under the Endangered Species Act. So because of this, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is currently reviewing the status of the Southern Sea Otter, and I mentioned this in the, um, the first week. And so they are gathering all the best available scientific and commercial data um, regarding the species, and that includes population trends, right? The most recent 2019 numbers, distribution, demographics, genetics, habitat conditions, threats, and, and all these different sort of conservation me uh, measures. And so now I'd like to read a quote uh, from Lillian Carswell, and she is the Southern Sea Otter Recovery Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so she says, reaching this threshold is a milestone in Southern Sea Otter recovery but it will be important to review all factors influencing the population to determine whether or not delisting is appropriate using the best available science. For the Southern Sea Otter, those factors include ongoing threats such as shark bite mortality, lack of range expansion, and changes in prey. And so again, understanding population trends, range expansion, and ultimately population recovery 
it is complex and there are many different factors that are included and need to be continuously monitored to give us a good picture of what is really happening. And so now this brings me into some of the previous questions that we did receive from people. These aren't necessarily specific to range, but uh, we felt, felt that these sort of fit the best into this segment. Um, so my first question that I received was, uh, why do females live longer than males? Um, so there are many different studies, but one of the most recent is Lamatra's in 2019. And that study showed that females in general female mammals in general do have longer lifespans than their male counterparts. And so they really looked at 101 different species and found that over 18% generally females had medium lifespan of, of longer, you know, than males at 18.6% and human females a little bit less. So it's 7.8% longer. Um, but though none of these studies can really empirically confirm the exact reason. So many studies support the theory that a lot of what we see in sex differences in, in mortality in mammals is most likely shaped by where they live, right? So the environmental conditions that they have, the sex specific cost of sexual selection. So what is really happening for males and females and what they do for their day to day? So for one, one thing to consider is important um, is individual fitness. So you can kind of think like, well, how many offspring can that otter produce? So if you're a male, you're likely to be capable of copulating with many females. And even if you have a short life, you still could potentially spread your genes with a, and end up having a high fitness. While females are constrained to that one pup per year, and they also require much more time and energy to produce and raise those pups. Um, another thing to consider is, is male mammals are generally more prone to risky behaviors. And so um, if we just consider sea otter dynamics, right? Males defend or try to acquire territories and that can be quite costly. So if they cannot hold a territory with a healthy food source, they could end up potentially in areas with very limited resources and that ultimately impacts their overall health. So some of these habitats might be further offshore, put them in areas of higher risk for shark predation, you know, all of that. So versus if you consider females, they're very site specific and they settle in areas closer to shore um, hopefully with a good food source to support their expensive reproductive costs. So hopefully that kind of touches on that question for that individual. The second question that I received um, sort of had a series, but what happens to pups post weaning? Where do males go and where do females go after their pups are weaned? Um, so I just want everyone to remember that, you know, young males are not likely to hold territories right off the bat, right? So those sub adults are most likely going to be pushed out by their, that territorial male, right? right when they get weaned. Um, and so they're forced to disperse. And sometimes they, they do find themselves in an all male raft. We do have occasional rafts like that. Or like I mentioned before, um, they could end up in the less desirable habitats. So they're out in sort of riskier habitats. Um, and so generally I like to think males are considered those bold explorers and maybe forced upon them. <laughs> but while young females generally, they settle and they're very site specific. Um, as for a, a female post weaning who has just sort of um, left her pup, general observations are that they do separate from their pups. So essentially ditching them, right? And so I know we talked about in the first week we had an example of a, a female who is um, we just in February, very well known in Monterey Harbor. And um, first day she was with her, her older pup. And then the second day she ditched that pup and she was seen in Moss Landing foraging on caper clams. So she took that long swim from Monterey Harbor all the way to Moss Landing. Um, but I, another theme I want you guys to remember, which was kind of through all of these webinars, is that sea otters are individuals, right? So not all may go to that distance that that female did, but some might not need to be that drastic. Um, but generally females, we do see that they try to separate themselves. And this might also be due to the fact that, you know, pups are going to keep asking and wanting until they can't physically do so. Um, but to really study this, you do have to kind of consider that you would need a, you need tagged females, but you also would need tagged pups and sort of a long-term tagging program. Um, and generally data is really on tagged females. So we do have observations of female, tagged females leaving for a period of time but there's not really been a specific project focused on this question that's also tagged pups um, to that degree. So it would require a lot more work, but generally females do separate from pups. And then our final question I received in pre-question was, um, so how can you identify a male sea otter if genitals are hard to see? Um, is he only present for mating and is he a threat to pups? So 
it is true that there are, of course, some general indicators that can help sort of with your intuition of which sex you're looking at. Um, so yes, we did touch on this in the first week too. Females generally have no scars and for males, it is less common. But remember, it was Mythbuster, males are, do sometimes have scarring, okay? So it's not always 100%. And there is, of course, the occasional female, and it's rare, but they might have a black nose. So that's one sort of way to get a little bit of intuition, but it's not 100%. And as for behavior, um, males can exhibit that belly down swimming or they're that sort of patrolling. Um, a lot of times you'll kind of see them come sniff every single individual of the group if they're a territorial male and make sure they're checking on everyone through the raft. And sometimes they'll tend to rest slightly off to one side, so separated from that group. Um, but again, it really depends on the individual. Um, these kind of can be general and they can help us um, sort of give us a sense, but we've all been tricked before. <laughs> I've definitely seen males sleep in the middle. I've seen them off to the side. Um, so, and I've also seen some females that are very masculine in appearance, right? They look a little bit bigger, they have a thicker neck and they also do that sort of patrolling swim so they can kind of trick you. Um, so we really recommend looking for when they roll, right? So their sea otters are quite fidgety. So a lot of times you'll see them kind of do that roll. And when their tummy gets a little bit wet, it can help you see either that baculum or for females, you can also um, see sometimes the nipples and a little fuzzy lump at the base of the tail. And so as for the second part of that question, um, you know, again, remember males either kind of follow on that territorial or bachelor strategy. And if they're territorial, they're actively patrolling their area and they are present. So they might not necessarily be in the raft at that moment, but they're working hard, making sure that they keep that territory. So they are there and part of that group um, more than just during copulation. Um, while for a bachelor, you know, might sneak in and there's a potential for a copulation and then maybe he would most likely bounce and get out of that territory if it was held by a territorial male. Um, but as to our knowledge, there is no known case of infanticide with sea otters. So there's no case of a male sea otter actively doing away with a pup. And so although there have been those cases we talked about in week one about um, males holding pups hostage, it is very rare. And ultimately, even in that case, it's not necessarily a threat to the pup as much as of an annoyance to the pup and the mother. Okay, so this now brings us to our first open questionnaire. So I'm going to ask um, Jenna and Mike to join me. I'm putting my camera back on. Hi, everyone. <laughs> And so if anyone has questions related to population and status and stuff like that, feel free to ask and we will um, be here to answer. And Robin, I think you'll be um, sort of mitigating through all of the, the questions. Yes, yes, I will. Right now we've got some, some high mics. Phil and Carol Adams are on. All right, so we've got uh, one question um, from Phil Arnold. Do you think pups and moms recognize each other after they have separated? That's a very good question. Jenna, do you want to? Yeah, so as Heather mentioned in the, the previous slide, it's it's somewhat uncommon for to have both the mother and the pup tagged um, before weaning because pups are small and, and you want to be really careful um, putting tags on them, and especially radio transmitters. There's all kinds of um, caveats for, for whether or not you, you can tag a pup. And so because of that, there's a relatively small sample. Um, but uh, especially in Monterey, Michelle Stedler's study looking at moms and pups has probably had the most um, information where, where their uh, relationship was known. And we, we have seen some anecdotally um, we can see what would could be interpreted as recognition behavior between mothers and pups greeting each other um, in a group setting. But um, more detailed research has gone on um, looking at uh, um, connections between recites and how whether one otter is observed more in the presence of another otter 
um, than one somewhere else. And so there has been some support for uh, um, daughters interacting um, slightly more frequently with moms than with a random female in some cases. But that's, again, that's a limited study just in the, in the Monterey Bay area with a few examples. I think we lost Mike. Did we lose him? I'm here. Oh, he's there. <laughs> Do you have anything to add to that, Mike? Uh, no, I, I just think trying to characterize that recognition behavior is always going to be extremely challenging. So yeah. quantifying yeah. that type of interaction is going to always be uh, subjective to observer error. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right, we've got a, another question um, from Scott Walls, um, who is a sea life steward. Uh, what studies have been done to understand the available food sources levels across their range and if it will support an increase in their population? That's a very good question. Um. Uh, well, if Mike's not going to chime in, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll start. So, so there's, there's been um, a few long-term studies uh, looking at densities of marine invertebrates along the coast. Um, you see one out of UC Santa Cruz, um, PISCO uh, has done, has pretty long-term data sets. Um, I think it's pretty well established with, within the center of the range that um, otters are prey limited or food limited. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean an influx of, of prey can't happen and shift shift um, their population status, but that's a very sort of tenuous situation at the center of the range. So um, I don't think I'm doing the greatest job of answering this question, Mike. Do you have any? Yeah, I, I guess I'd just add, I, I'm not aware of anything that's, any work that's specifically addressed sea otter food availability um, throughout their range or on the range peripheries. Um, sea otters will be somewhat opportunistic when they move into a new habitat. Um, so it'd be a quite a endeavor to take on that type of a, a study to try to capture food resource availability um, in these large areas. Some small areas of particular interest have had um, very specific survey work uh, completed to investigate whether or not it might be viable sea otter habitat with some level of food resource, but I don't think that the question, at the level that the question's posing. Yeah, I just would add that um, often we have to take advantage of studies that weren't necessarily targeting sea otter prey, but they're looking at um, species that otters might eat for other studies. And so we have to take advantage of those kinds of data. So that's really where the PISCO data came in and, and useful, I know, for um, a study that I did for my master's thesis back in um, 2003. But it wasn't targeting sea otter prey. We had to hope that there were some species in there that, that were relevant to this, the particular question that we were asking. So sometimes we have to be able to take advantage of things that others have done. Yeah, I might add, you know, historically, back in the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, some of the targeted field studies to investigate prey populations were really, the, the foundation was to evaluate um, abundance and distribution of these prey populations relative to human use of those resources and how sea otter predation was going to impact those resources. And that continues today. <laughs> it does. Especially up north. Yeah. All right. We got another question from Morgan and Kathy. Are pups ever taken by another mother who lost a pup or motherless pup adopted? Mike? Um, we believe there have been a few instances where females have adopted 
but I think it's quite rare. Typically when a female hits reproductive age, she's either pregnant or caring for a pup. So that often doesn't present an opportunity for um, a female to take on an abandoned pup. So it's, if it does happen, it's gotta be very, very rare. Keep in mind that um, the propensity for that to potentially happen for sea otters is what is at the core of the success of the, the surrogacy program at, at Monterey Bay Aquarium. So those, those captive moms are essentially adopting another female's pup. Exactly. But the, those, those captive females are not allowed to breed. Right. So they're, um, they're not in that cycle of yeah. uh, caring for a pup or, or being pregnant. Is my camera on? Yeah, you're good. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right, we've got a, another question from Pete. Are there significant behavior differences between the California coast population and those of the Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska populations? Want me to jump in on this? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, at least to my knowledge, the most significant difference is some different foraging strategies. Um, populations in Alaska are known to feed on thin fish. Um, in California, that's a very, very rare event. It does happen, but it is rare. Uh, that's probably the biggest significant behavioral difference I can think of. All right, we have a question from Diana Barnhart. How many females usually are in the harem and how many males are in Morro Bay? Me again? Um, uh, you yeah. wanna go, Jenna? Well, I don't, know, I don't know if the term harem is ever applied to a raft of, of females. Um, they, they raft together um, when their habitats overlap and, and um, uh, may have particular favorite spots for rafting together that shift uh, over short and long term. But I, I, I don't think we, I don't know, Mike, have you ever heard the word harem? No, yeah, generally the female raft with a territorial male. Um, and I don't think that question's ever been evaluated through survey data. And I think it'd be very challenging to, um, to evaluate based on the data we collect right now doing surveys. Um, as far as the number of males inside Morro Bay, territorial males, um, we don't know. Um, at some point, not long ago, I speculated we had at least three territorial males. And that was based on observations that occurred post removal of one known territorial male and watching the dynamics that played out. Um, but without having these animals tagged um, and or doing really intensive um, field observations, uh, wouldn't want to take a guess right now. Awesome, so I think we'll uh, wait another minute to see if there's any more questions coming in. Um, but uh, I guess if we don't have any, we'll move on to Mike. Yeah, we can move forward and there's always more time. There's gonna be two more question sections. So even if you come up with something later, there's, you can always ask it in the next section as well. And at the end, we'll be open to any question that comes to, to mind, so. All right. Hi. Okay, so then I'm going to put it over to you, Mike. I'm going to end my I can get this back in order. Stop my video. And I'm going to put you in the right, hopefully. I can get this oh. thing to do this. There we go. All right. Now I see my, my camera is working. I didn't realize that the first part of the. <laughs> um, all right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about sea otter mortality and specifically about shark related mortality. The reason we're gonna target sharks is uh, it has become the single greatest 
individual source of mortality, and it's actually having a population level impact um, and is impeding us hitting recovery goals with the California population. Um, so if we go to the first slide, uh, this slide presents the number of sea otter strandings by year. Uh, and just a little bit of background, uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife initiated studies on sea otter mortality back in 1968. And we've continued with this intensive program at, since then, where we attempt to recover and examine every reported stranded otter in California. Uh, it's now probably the largest data set of sea otter mortal or mortality of any wildlife species. You know, we're over 50 years now where we've attempted to uh, characterize sea otter mortality in quite uh, fine detail. So you see here the numbers of sea otter carcasses that are recovered every year um, from the late 80s into 2019. The yellow portion of these bars are mortalities associated with white shark bites. Um, and as you can see, we've always had some small component of the stranding assemblage as dying as a result of shark bites. But it wasn't really until the mid to late 2000s where we noticed a very significant change and the number of shark bitten carcasses has increased significantly and is really the primary driver to these record level of carcasses that we're recovering now in the last few years. You know, the last few years you see we're hitting well over 400 carcasses um, are being collected. Uh, some previous work has identified that we're likely only recovering approximately 50% of the known of the dead animals, dead sea otters every year. So the number, uh, the, the carcass, the, what am I trying to say, the mortality rate per capita is quite high. Um, and it's again being driven by this high rate of sh shark mortality. The sharks don't, we have no evidence that sharks are consuming sea otters. Uh, we characterize it as an investigative bite. Um, we're seeing no indication of second bites or soft tissue removed. So we really characterize this event as a uh, investigative interaction. Um, and we're trying to understand what are some of the dynamics that might be driving this increase in interaction besides the fact of maybe just a growing white shark population. Um, let's go to the next slide. So this, um, there's a graphic, the, the map on the right you might have seen if you watched Dr. Chris Lowe's presentation a few days ago. But this is work that we published um, back in 2016 in Mammal Science. And this just gives you a sense of the temporal and spatial changes that we saw in shark bitten sea otters through time. So if you look at the graph on the left, those bar graphs show you how the proportion of shark bitten otters to other sources of mortality have changed through time. Um, and the 2009 to 2013 period was the first where shark mortality exceeded all other causes of mortality. If you look at the, the map, this can give you a sense of how the shark mortality changed through time in a spatial sense. You know, back in the 1985 to 1999 period, it's very, very rare for me to collect a shark bitten otter along our section of coast, you know, Stero Bay, Cambria, Stero Bay, down along Fismo. You don't see any red dots along that section of coastline during that timeline. Then as we move forward into the early 2000s, Fismo Beach South started seeing a significant uptick in shark bitten otters. Uh, the north, still remain fairly consistent during that time frame. We always had a kind of a hot spot for shark related mortality on the way going north. It wasn't really until the, the latter period of this study, um, the late 2000s and into 2013, where the level of shark 
bite mortality increased on the north end of the range. And we're now having what we consider a hot spot up in the north end of Monterey Bay. And then all of Estero Bay, uh, Morro Bay, Pismo Beach southward has become um, areas where the, the level of shark bite mortality is quite significant. And looking at some current data, <clears throat> the, the proportion of cases I collect say down at Pismo, if we were to separate those cases where we cannot determine whether trauma is involved, um, we're getting somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% of those cases in Pismo are shark bitten. So quite significant and it is again having this, this very um, high population level impact. Uh, next slide. All right, so I threw this together quickly because I knew somebody had already presented this question to the group. What is the sex composition of shark bitten otters? Is there a bias? And if you look at this, you'll see you know, the orange bars are the percent female, the blue bars are percent male, and males have always been a larger component of the shark bitten carcass assemblage. Um, Keep in mind when looking at this graph that the number of shark bitten cases in any given year was quite low all the way up through the early 2000s. So as an example, what, 1985 and 86, 100% are males, but we only had a very few carcasses that were shark bitten that year. What I think is significant here is if we're looking at this graph in the, the later part, say from 2000, to 2019, where we have still a higher proportion of males, which I'll get into in a minute what, why I think that's likely the case. But what is more significant is the, the higher proportion of females for the larger um, number of carcasses that are collected in a given year. Uh, males really don't Males don't have the same level of importance to population recovery that females do. So the loss of a female is far more significant than the loss of a male. So if we're now seeing 40, 35, 40% of the shark bitten otters being female, and we're recovering up 150 shark bitten otters a year, um, that has long-term impact to population growth. Uh, why the, the sex composition might be skewed uh, is likely because males will tend to be the primary demographic using open water habitat. And we believe that that open water habitat makes animals more uh, susceptible to being bit uh, compared to otters that might spend a higher proportion of their, their time inside kelp, kelp canopies. We believe that kelp canopy, that surface canopy, does provide some type of visual um, refuge from sharks that are predating uh, or hunting from below. Um, so that might be one of the things that's driving uh, the sex composition and why we're seeing more, more males and more females. Um, I don't have any graphics for this, but I, in anticipation of the question, how do we know that these are all white shark bites. Uh, to date, we haven't collected any evidence to suggest other shark species are involved. Um, of the um, sharks that do overlap with sea otter habitat, white sharks are the only one that have a serrated tooth. And that serrated edge on the tooth um, can leave some diagnostic characteristics in the wound pattern that it uh, produces. That, that serrated edge hits hard bone, uh, it will leave a parallel scratch pattern on the bone. So we can use that as a, as a diagnostic to confirm that the event was a white shark uh, interaction. And the other uh, even better confirmation is the teeth will often fracture during these interactions when they hit hard objects. So it's not too uncommon for us to actually find tooth fragments of shark inside some of these wounds. 
And again, seeing that serrated edge on a tooth fragment um, confirms it as being white shark. So to date, uh, all of these interactions are believed to be white sharks with no evidence supporting other species interactions. Um, I think that's it. What do I have next? Next slide. Oh, I forgot about this. Um, so this is exactly what I was just describing. If you look at the um, uh, photograph on the far left, uh, that far left photograph, you'll actually see an uh, embedded white shark tooth fragment and that serrated edge. Um, and then the photo B on the right is a different case, but if you look at that area of bone that has that scratch pattern, if you were to look closely at that, that scratch pattern that's a parallel scratch that um, very closely resembles that serrated edge. So when we see wounds like what you're seeing in picture C um, that are very characteristic of a white sh of a shark bite, um, unless we find these two diagnostics, either tooth fragment or that scratch pattern, um, we need that to confirm it as being a white shark bite. Um, uh, what's the other question? Oh, is uh, consistent year round? Uh, no. So historically, we saw a very distinct pattern to white shark bites in California. Uh, a very strong peak late summer in the fall, and then it would taper off. But more recently, uh, in the last 10 years, that peak in shark bites um, has broadened significantly. Um, we have shark bitten otters throughout the year, but that, that peak still exists in late summer and fall, but we still get high numbers. Now, instead of tapering off quite quickly into say December, um, we start seeing the slow tapering of cases into April. Um, April is maybe the slowest time of year for shark bite sea otters, shark bitten sea otters, um, but that's all relative. Um, now, I think this month alone, we've already had somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 shark bitten otters collected. Um, and it's only gonna be into May, June, when things are gonna start ramping right back up again. Uh, we expect to get an increase in numbers. Um, next slide. Uh, is this a leading factor why females live longer than males? Since some females seek shark-free sanctuaries like the harbors. Um, maybe. And I guess where I'd go with this is that um, it might get into habitat use uh, along the open coast. Females are going to tend to raft up in uh, kelp habitat, again, that kelp habitat providing some level of re refuge um, from the shark interactions. Uh, Non-territorial males are going to be pushed out to less preferred habitat, and that often means open water. And we believe otters in open water are higher targets for um, having higher chances of these interactions with sharks. So that might play out into a little bit. Um, I think there's other factors that are probably driving some of the differences in the demographic mortality rates. Um, you know, shark trauma being one of them, but males, again, if they're not a territorial male, um, they're being pushed into uh, suboptimal habitat um, that has maybe poor food resources um, and it's more challenging for them to make a living. Um, but shark interactions might be playing some role there. Um, next. All right, um, open for questions. Awesome, thanks for that, Mike. Um, so we've got a question um, from Claire. She says, Heather said there are more otters north of Cayucas. I've been to Cerro Bluffs and have not seen any. Where could I go to see otters in the central grouping? Um, 
So Astero Bluffs, there are a large number of otters, but it will be very challenging uh, to spot. Astero Bluffs has a very, a relatively low elevation um, and the kelp beds extend far offshore and most of the large rafts do tend to occur at the outer edge of the kelp bed. So unless you're very patient and it's a, a nice day, low swell, low wind, and you have the patience to scan, um, particularly looking with binoculars to the outer edges of the kelp bed, um, you might not find the otters out there. Of course, the most ideal unique spot to see otters is inside Morro Bay. Um, you've got the group at Target Rock and often the uh, group that's hanging out at the South Tee Pier. Um, those are quite unique opportunities to be standing so close to otters uh, and get such a um, close-up view of them. Uh, with the exceptional moss landing, uh, there's nowhere else in the California coast where you'll be able to have such a, a great view of them. But be patient, take your time, pick your weather days and get back out on the Cerro Bluffs and, and do some scans, you'll find them. Yeah, I would just add to that. So we've done a couple of uh, long-term studies of tagged otters in that area where uh, experienced trackers have had to find specific otters with flipper tags and radio transmitters. And it's challenging even when you have a high power telescope. So, so for someone just walking along the bluffs with a pair of binoculars, it's, it's extra challenging. And you can, you can always keep an eye out for foragers that are closer inshore, but the resting rafts are gonna be pretty darn far out and, and hard to see. So a good, a good spotting scope helps and um, otter tracker, lore um, the best weather is is overcast windless um, with a little bit of sun coming over your your shoulder um, to light things up and so pick a day like that and go out and and look for otters out there because they're definitely there cool all right we've got a, another question from phil arnold have you come across otters that have survived a bite or are atta uh, attacks generally fatal uh, most of the time they are um, most of the time the otter is going to die as a result or we're going to humanely euthanize the animal. Um, there have been a few cases that are deemed rehabable and we get them up to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and they've been treated and released. Um, there's at least one case that was shark bitten, was rehabbed, put back out in the wild and then found dead later as another shark bite. Um, Otters can be very challenging to evaluate for shark-related wounds, and most of that's a result of the loose skin. So the best way to think about this is um, a, a small sharp knife going through that, that loose skin, the skin moving around with that, that blade um, macerating everything underneath and then the knife comes out and exteriorly you only see a small penetrating wound but the extent of the damage below the skin um, is quite extensive so it, it's it's challenging for the um, veterinarians to fully evaluate these cases um, of course the animals have to be fully sedated to get in there and, and probe but more often than not the damage is way worse than anything you see externally. Um, we have another question from um, Phil. Do sharks think otters are seals and do not actually eat them, but simply kill them thinking they are seals, but they are fur balls? <laughs> yeah, that's almost certainly what's driving this interaction. Sharks are visual predators. They see the silhouette. They investigate with their mouth. Um, they bite a sea otter. Sea otters have no blubber compared to the, the prime prey, elephant seals and sea lions. So the, the foraging strategy is to investigate, take that first bite. If it's then primary prey, the sharks will turn around and come back in for the consumptive kill or bite, whatever you want to call it. Um, again, with otters, we see only 
evidence of that initial investigative bite. So it's like the shark, it's very similar to what happens with people or when they bite surfboards. It, that item's bit, shark identifies it as non-primary target prey, doesn't come back uh, to consume it. Um, you know, with any prey predator interaction, there's always risk to a predator every time it initiates one of these interactions. So if it's not going to be a, a high reward prey capture, uh, we suspect that's what turns the sharks away. They're, they they don't they don't catch an otter as being uh, high value prey. And they're a pretty little guy, so one exploratory bite is. Yeah. That'd be pretty devastating. All right, so it looks like that's the, the last question for that series. Again, we'll have a third opportunity to, to ask questions. So if you've still got questions, feel free to put them in the box and we'll at, um, answer them at the end of Jenna's talk. Okay. Oh, real so quick, if you have one question, you might as well jump into. I have one last question if we want to jump into it really quick. Oh. Yep. Okay, does the increase in shark bites coincide with an increase in sharks? Yeah, I should have gotten into this a little bit. Um, some of you may have listened to Dr. Chris Lowe's talk and you covered this quite well. So we do believe that white shark population has, is recovering. The population is growing. Um, and that's likely the fundamental change that's driving a lot of this um, uh, interaction with sea otters, but it may not be the only thing. Um, Dr. Lowe described the thermal tolerant capability of, of juvenile white sharks compared to adults. Juveniles, sub-adults, don't have the body mass that typically allows them to uh, roam in wa colder waters north of Point Conception. So if we're dealing with slight changes in ocean temperature, related to climate change, that those slight changes might be playing a factor why we're starting to see a younger demographic of white sharks north of Point Conception and now overlapping with sea otter habitat compared to what we saw historically. But uh, fundamentally, all the evidence does support a, a, a rebounding growth of white sharks along our coast. Awesome. Very cool. All right. So we'll go ahead and go to our third panelist, Jenna Bentel. Hey, everybody. Uh, so foraged oncology is probably my favorite thing uh, to, to study with sea otters. Um, it's fascinating. It's multi-layered, it's complex. Um, the word complex and complexity are words that you're probably gonna hear um, often today. Heather used them a couple times already, um, and that's because ecological e ecology is a complex topic with lots of interactions, lots of things going on by nature. So over the last two decades, I've devoted a substantial portion, proportion of my work days to watching sea otters eat. And even today, I'm completely captivated by the sight of a foraging sea otter and always wondering what they're eating. Okay, next slide, Heather. This is just a reminder. Um, we're gonna be talking about a pretty broad foraging related topic today um, that is closely um, related to keystone, the keystone species topic. So I just wanted to bring back this slide from Heather's talk on the first webinar uh, gives you a definition of what keystone species is. So this is based on an architectural concept. If you look at a stone arch, next time you walk through a stone arch, as you're going through, look up above you and you'll see this keystone shaped piece that is holding the arch together. Um, so that is the anal analogy meant to represent species that have an especially great impact on their community, community structure despite relatively low numbers or, or small size. If keystone species are removed, that can have a pretty dramatic change on the community they live in. 
Uh, today, I'm just going to focus on a big picture issue that has emerged in the last decade and it has the potential to deepen our understanding of the Keystone phenomenon, particularly in California coastal ecosystems. And before we move on to the next slide, I just wanted to put in a plug for a really great video that you can find on YouTube called Some Animals Are More Equal Than Others, Keystone Species and Trophic Cascades. This is a super engaging, um, relatively short video that really defines and illustrates the Keystone concept uh, really well. So I suggest you look, up that, look that up on YouTube and, and give it a watch. Next. So this is really, this has been our comfort, our ecological comfort place for sea otters for a pretty long time. And, and it was a good place to start. So there on the left side, we have um, habitat with sea otters, nice rich kelp forest ecosystem. And on the right side, uh, without sea otters, uh, what amounts to essentially an underwater desert or an urchin barren. The characterization of the ecological role of sea otters is rooted in work done by uh, Dr. James Estes in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska in the 1970s. This was among the first to adopt the term keystone species and one of a handful of pioneering studies investigating the importance of predators to the structure of ecosystems around the world. And one more quick plug, um, actually done by the same uh, filmmakers as the uh, YouTube video I just recommended. There's another full length feature film called Serengeti Rolls that really features this story of these, these pioneering scientists who um, really looked in, in, and coined the Keystone concept. Uh, Dr. Esty's study was a comparative study. He was observing and comparing the state of places with healthy sea otter populations versus places where they had yet to recover. How was this large scale ecological study possible? Uh, it was only possible because of the near extirpation of sea otters by the fur trade that left a fragmented population with scattered remnant colonies. So we could see, have a little window into what those ecosystems looked like uh, in a world with sea otters. So simple system, elegant science, simple trophic cascade, trophic of or related to feeding effects on a top predator that cascade or flow down the food chain. But Seattle scientists in California have long been aware that things are more complicated and that a different team of players was likely to respond differently to change. Next slide. An opportunity to better understand this complexity swept the coast of North America in the 2000 teens in the form of a virus, a sea star wasting disease that caused a number of sea star species to literally disintegrate before our eyes. Um, the loss of some of the predatory invertebrates, in particular our, our familiar um, intertidal ochre stars, Pisaster, and the giant uh, raptorial sunflower star of the subtitle that Pycnopodia had cascading effects uh, throughout our coastal ecosystems, some of which were, were somewhat surprising. So pockets of, un, of urchin barrens began appearing in places long inhabited by sea otters. So um, who is missing in the right hand panel uh, photo? It's not sea otters, it's Pycnopodia. And on the left hand, um, sorry, the left hand is missing Pycnopodia and the right hand is, has um, a fully functional ecosystem. So, um, sea otters are present and we have urchin barrens. How is this even possible considering what we know about the keystone effect of sea otters? Will sea otters adapt to this new abundance of prey? Are sea otters mediating the consequences of the loss of sunflower stars? Uh, urchins inside the barrens are too starved to produce roe that otters and humans favor. So in the photo on the left, you can see a sea urchin from an urchin barren, and they don't have enough nutrition, enough energy to even produce the roe, the gonads, the orange substance that both sea otters and humans love to eat. And you can see healthy urchins in a healthy kelp forest on the right are just packed full of those orange, um, highly nutritious, energy-rich roe. So 
if sea otters are avoiding eating urchins in the barrens because they don't really have any yummy stuff inside, how can they possibly be effective at reducing those barrens? So for now, the best answer to many of those questions or the best response is really good question. Um, and we're still, scientists are still trying to figure out the answers to those. So it's not very satisfying for a Q&A, but it, it poses a lot of interesting questions for you to think about and certainly a lot of topics for discussion. Um, much of the loss of, much like the loss of sea otters to the fur trade and the loss uh, the loss of these sea star species is a large scale perturbation that has, is really an opportunity for scientists to learn more about these complex systems. Uh, next. One thing we know as we move from our simple three level trophic cascade in Alaska, south to California is that the cast of characters changes and grows in number and the food web becomes more complex. Sea otters are, are still eating machines, undoubtedly playing a very important role in structuring California's kelp forest, but they are not alone in preying on sea urchins. So there's, a, there's an ecological term called functional redundancy, um, and this is defined as a phenomena that multiple species representing a variety of taxonomic groups can share similar, if not identical, roles in an ecosystem. And, and I actually looked up the word redundant in Merriam-Webster, um, and one of the definitions was uh, redundant serving as a duplicate for preventing failure of an entire system upon the failure of a single component. So we have other species here off our California coast that are feeding, also feeding heavily on sea urchins. These guys are like the backup quarterbacks for each other, right? If one of them gets knocked out of the game, the other ones are still there eating urchins and there may be some time lags involved in in them sort of adapting to that change in prey abundances but it overall uh, amounts to a more intricate uh, complex food web that probably uh, increases this has a stabilizing effect on on the food web and makes it less vulnerable to perturbation by the loss of one any one of those predators so with the shift in predator and prey densities, we're provided with an opportunistic experiment for the possible role of one predator, sea otters in this case, to maybe diminish the effects of one of the other members of this team um, being removed from the system, the kelp forest ecosystem. Okay, next please. Understanding or even recognition of ecological interactions is sometimes only possible um, in the event of a natural experiment like this, um, is experimental manipulations of these kinds of systems are ethically questionable. Um, they're often logistically difficult or impossible, and in many cases illegal. So we have to, to uh, these kind of uh, events, even though they're devastating, we have to be able to take advantage of them to help us understand some of the more complicated questions. Scientists would never want nor be able to remove an entire species from a food web to study its role, but in this case, we can take advantage of that having happened to increase our understanding. Um, there is a study that has been underway studying the response of nearshore ecosystems off the coast of Monterey um, to the devastation of sea star wasting disease. Uh, the study, study is funded by NSF, National Science Foundation. Uh, it's in a collaborative effort by um, University uh, California at Santa Cruz, USGS, Monterey Bay Aquarium, and other partners. And they've been working to answer some of those questions that I posed earlier. Um, and the first results from that uh, study are underway and nearing publication. And until we get those results out, we really don't have super solid um, answers, but it certainly does um, provide an interesting story. And the story is ongoing and I can't wait to see how it all turns out. And hopefully I'll be able to share some more um, up-to-date data with you soon, as soon as those results are published. Okay. Awesome, thanks Jenna. All right, so we'll, um, 
uh, start with uh, questions again. Uh, we don't have any in just yet. But that's really exciting. When do you say that you'll, when are you projected to know to get those results in? Um, it's, it's in manuscript form. So the author, the co-authors on the first publication to come out of this NSF study is, is currently being reviewed in manuscript, manuscript form amongst, um, amongst that group of scientists. So uh, within, I would say within a year, we would. That's exciting. Did we lose Mike? No, I'm here. <laughs> Are we supposed to be be back on? Oh, no, just wanted to see your face. <laughs> All right, so we'll probably leave it up for another five minutes or so um, to bring the questions in. Is there anything that um, the three of you wanted to bring up or to discuss? just to wrap up this um, Sea Otter Series webinar. Oh. oh, we do have one question that just popped. Okay, so um, Phil Arnold um, asks, is the Morro Bay population foraging inside the bay and can the bay continue to satisfy their needs long term? If they're leaving the bay to forage, how far are they going? And if they're leaving, do the females take their pups with them? I can um, answer that. I'll start out answering that. Um, so we don't have tags on otters in Morro Bay right now. So any tagged otters you might see are either um, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium rehab releases or they have a remnant tag from a prior study. So we don't really have a good way to track where they move in on any level of detail. Uh, we had a tagged otter study back 2012 to 2014, um, where we had a number of, of otters, both males and females, tagged within the Cayucas Moro Bay area. And what we saw was that all of those females moved between um, Moro Bay and other locations um, nearby. So their, their home range would encompass, include Moro Bay, but they would go up to Cayucas, some would go to Point Bouchon, and some even went as far up as, as Cambria, um, and none of them stayed full time inside the harbor. So this again was 2012, 2014. We don't, but we don't know if that pattern is holding today. We don't know if um, they're moving to that extent or staying more localized inside the bay. And then um, the other part of that question about foraging, um, I would be fairly confident in saying that some, at least some of the sea otters that are in Morro Bay are, are foraging outside of the bay. That certainly was the case back when we had tagged animals. So there's probably some that are coming and going and maybe some that are staying and foraging right inside. Um, but again, it's really hard to get at that question when we don't have uh, the ability to look at specifically marked individuals and mothers will always take their pups with them. So from birth up until weaning, that pup is with mom when she's foraging. So yes to that. You have anything to add, Mike? No, I think you captured that well. Um, yeah, I think maybe the one caveat that moms, particularly real small pups, aren't going to dive with mom. And oh, well, they're leave, not diving, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she'll leave them on the surface or wrapped up in kelp if she's foraging nearby. But yeah. um, I just, you know, my own recent observations, I see otters moving in and out of the harbor mouth. Um, and yeah. my assumption is they're heading out foraging and coming back in. As far as the bay, I think there's still probably a significant untapped food resource uh, in the back bay to support more otters. And that's really the one of the characteristics of the bay that has made this a, a location where Monterey Bay Aquarium has decided to start trying to release some of its rehab animals. Um, we have reason to believe that, that the back part of the bay can support a fair, fair number of animals, more than that's there, um, and it's considered kind of a soft release for 
animals that have gone through rehab um, that can easily be monitored. So um, we suspect or Moral Bay might, might continue to grow still for a period of time. All right, we have a, another question from Scott Walls. What is the reason the urchins don't have row? So when they're when they're in when they formed an urchin barren, they basically denude the the substrate of of edible material. So often what you see is just um, uh, rock that may have a, a layer of really tough coralline encrusting algae on it, and not much else in terms of kelp or or um, foliose algae. And so the urchins are starving, so they don't have enough energy to put into um, reproduction and, and building that row. So they're almost, they're essentially, as far as the sea otter is concerned, or human, they're essentially like empty containers. Um, and so sea otters will, one of the, the interesting um, characteristics of the barrens that are, that are off Monterey is that they're sort of, po they're pockets, you know, they're not vast stretches of, of barrens, they're, they're adjacent to healthy kelp areas where sea otters are feeding. And so they, we know that the otters are still feeding in the preferentially in the kelp areas and not in the um, in the barrens, but they may be um, mitigating the expansion of the barrens by feeding on the reproductive urchins that are that are on the periphery, right? So those are the animals with gonads with row that are that are going to be reproducing, and the ones in the barrens are are um, are not contributing so much to that. All right, we've got a question from Pete. Uh, many years ago, there was speculation that chest pounding to open food, mainly clams, resulted in cardiac arrhythmias, resulting in death. Has there been any further study of this? That's a mic question. Uh, that's the first I've ever heard of that. Um, I'm not familiar with that association. I haven't heard it. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got another question from Claire. Could Jenna share the names of the two YouTube videos again? Oh, okay. Some uh, Here I can some know. species are more important than others. That one? Um, no. There yes. we go. There it is. Some there it is. Are... Some animals are more equal than others. <laughs> and the other is Serengeti rules. The Serengeti rules. And both of those videos feature, feature um, Jim Estes, who, as I mentioned, was the scientist that, that really um, uh, did the pioneering work with sea otters as a keystone species. And they're pretty engaging and interesting stories with some, some um, pretty innovative scientists. Uh, we've got a question from Phil. Goals like being around otters when they're eating because they use rocks to break open animals and cause a big messy problem. That actually may be more of a comment. But does anybody have <laughs> yeah. um, anything to, to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, gulls are certainly um, kleptoparasites of sea otters. So they'll, <laughs> they'll follow them around. Um, is, they seem to key in on, I don't even know how they do this, but if an otter gets something particularly good, like every gull in the area gets the gets the uh, message the text message and and you know they'll be circled by something so one of the when we're collecting foraging data if we see an otter come up and there's like nine gulls on them we know it's going to be something really exciting so yeah they'll they'll pick up little bits and pieces that the otter drops they um i have only very rarely seen them actually snatch something from the otter's grasp. Usually they're picking up stuff um, that they're dropping. And one interesting thing too is they'll often key in, kind of like um, the males that, that Heather mentioned um, in the previous webinar, they'll kind of key in on a pup that's on the surface by itself and because they know that the mom is going to come up probably with some prey. And some moms are really tolerant of that and others uh, really don't like it and will will launch themselves at, at the gull as soon as they get to the surface. So um, it's a pretty interesting interaction. I will say, I don't know if, if Mike has seen anything different, but I have only ever seen Western gulls do this. I've never seen any other gull species. <laughs> uh, 
hate identifying gulls, so I haven't paid that close attention. <laughs> They're the opportunist of the gulls. <laughs> Um, so we've got another question here. Are there any plans to tag the Morro Bay population and study them in depth? Currently, no. Some of us would like to, to see that. I, I would just like to see some flipper tags, um, but I don't think it's, it's likely in the near future. Yeah, I, I intend to initiate anything like this. I, as, as helpful as it would be to just get some tags on some of these local animals. Um, you know, we have to put together the, the, the full program and justify the, the whole process of capture, sampling, and tagging, uh, and then having a dedicated long-term uh, intensive follow-up of these animals. So uh, yeah, right now there's nothing in the works. Well, I think it's important for people to recognize the amount of effort as well as funding that would go into something like that and that's always you know always, always good funding so yeah it's a big group of people and it's also important you know we want that level of scrutiny um, for tagging um, programs because you know you don't want to put sea otters through the stress of even just getting flipper tags uh, without being committed to be able to being able to follow up with that long term so you know we don't want to Put them through unnecessary stress if we don't have the ability to follow through. Uh, we've got a question from Norma. Do you foresee any increase in range north or south if food resources become more limited for the current number of 3,000 animals? Um, technically the range has retracted in the last few years. Um, a lot of that is being driven by the high rates of mortality that we're seeing on the range peripheries. So right now there's nothing promising that natural range expansion um, will be occurring anytime soon. There has been some proposals that reintroduction to areas outside the range uh, might be beneficial, but that is years and years away in terms of programs like that being developed and then going through the regulatory and review process. We've got a question in case, um, oh, I already got that one. Uh, can we assume that sharks attacking the otters are juveniles? Um, are they just testing the otters to see if they're more than fur balls? Yes and no. So we certainly have evidence that adult white sharks are playing some role in this. You know, historically we always saw shark bitten otters up in areas like Anya Nuevo, a known spot for adult white sharks. Um, we do suspect that a significant part of this increase might be a result of younger sub-adult animals that are transitioning from fish feeding to marine mammal feeding that might be going through a, essentially a learning curve uh, in this foraging strategy and hitting otters more frequently than adults might, but we can't say for sure. And some of the work that Chris Lowe is leading um, with us trying to get tags on sharks in this area and look at movements and start getting a sense of age and sex composition of the sharks that are in these areas um, will hopefully help us address some of those questions. Um, we've got another question from Claire. Will the otters in the back bay be harmful to the oyster farm? Um, so we don't, we don't have um, a lot of data on sea otters eating oysters in any of our um, data sets, long-term data sets. So I, for one, have I've only ever seen a sea otter eat oyster once. Um, but, you know, this is an oyster, oyster farm, sort of an untested territory, I guess, where you have an oyster um, farm right in the middle of an area that's, that's potentially being recolonized or, or you know, a site where otters are expanding into and you know I have a pretty hard time believing that if a sea otter could get at farmed oysters it wouldn't eat them but um, th I think Mike the ones that are in the bay are pretty well protected they're in bags right so they, yeah they are in bags and there's been some 
uh, observational otters foraging on mussels on some of that structure surrounding the, the oyster operations, but we, to my knowledge, there haven't been any reports of otters tearing into those bags um, or observations of otters feeding on, on you know, oysters that have escaped or, you know, larval oysters that have, that have grown in the, the water surrounding that area. Right, we've got another question here, um, but I'm posing a question just because uh, they were asking if there's any uh, research of other animals. So I didn't know if that was in regards to future virtual mind walks or um, uh, in regards to sea otter research. Um, is there anything you guys want to bring up on that end? It, is there any, are there any new research projects? Is that sort of... The question is, uh, are there any plans to study other animals? Oh. I don't uh, know. I know Cal Poly's uh, been looking at some of the, the invertebrate prey populations inside Morro Bay, kind of specifically to address questions of food resource availability for sea otters. Um, but that question's pretty open-ended. I'm not sure if it's how it, how the question is targeting sea otter work. Uh, for sea otter research. Okay. They just responded, sorry. <laughs> so maybe interactions with... Yeah, isn't, so the aquarium's doing shark otter has the shark otter interaction study right mike going on uh be news to me um yeah i, I think you know the at least for what i'm involved in we're you know we are investing some resources to help facilitate the work that dr chris Lowe is doing on white sharks uh, because the sea otter research alliance this collaborative group of us all realize what an impact that that's having and see it's being a good use of our resources to help these guys better understand white shark population dynamics in the areas where it overlaps with otters um, other than that you know over the years we've done various things with relative to commercial fisheries so we have a better understanding of how there might be impacts interactions with those. One thing I will add is that um, the USGS uh, Western Ecological Research Center up based in Santa Cruz, uh, the Santa Cruz Field Station, they do um, really have been leading a lot of um, research related to sea otter ecology over the last couple decades and they really are trying to um, couch their study in the ecosystem context rather than just specifically looking at things sea otter that they're really trying to to, to study more um, complex um, the more complex overall ecosystem and have that be sort of a goal for their their future research so really are trying to to consider it in the broader ecosystem sense rather than just a specific species and e and sea otters are a great species uh, with which to to answer those questions Uh, we've got another shark question here. Are the white sharks coming into and inside of the kelp beds or are the attacks taking place outside the kelp beds? We don't know. Um, there was a recent paper put out by Monterey Bay Aquarium that suggests kelp beds may um, pose some level of refuge for the shark otter interaction. Um, but we also, at the same time, have seen more recent um, critter cam video of white sharks uh, in kelp habitat targeting pinniped prey. Um, so it's, it's uncertain, but I think what we, we're, uh, 
the the current theory is though that 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 canopy still does provide some visual um, refuge and, and may provide um, otters some hiding spots. But I suspect sharks are moving right through there way easier than any diver ever wants to acknowledge. And Mike can tell you for sure as a as a sea otter tagging capture diver that sea otters can be pretty hard to see from underneath um, when they're in the kelp bed, certainly much harder to see them when they're not in kelp. Yeah, if they're not moving, um, they're, they're hidden in the kelp canopy, their silhouettes hidden quite well. So if they're moving though, they could be uh, an easy target. One, one final thing I would add is that if, if you, <laughs> any of those listening ever witness uh, a shark fighting a sea otter, um, please, first of all, grab your phone and try to get video. <laughs> yeah. um, but that would be of extreme interest to pretty much everybody because yeah. there, there are no witness. Well, you know, there's some potential witness accounts, but they're not super solid and definitely not supported with, with video. So yeah, if you see it, say something. All right, it looks like that might be the end of the questions. Um, and I wanna thank all three of you so much because this was amazing. This is a, a rare treat um, for all of us to be able to have this. Um, and it's so neat on these virtual mind walks because we are recording them. So we can always refer to these in the future. They'll be uh, found on our YouTube page. A couple of people were asking how to um, catch some virtual mind walks. Um, if they've missed it or maybe missed some of it, you can find all of these virtual mind walks on our YouTube page. It's San Luis Obispo Coast District. Um, so go ahead and go on there. Um, obviously this one won't be up uh, maybe for another couple of days because it does take a, a bit just to get the captions in there. Um, but I, again, I wanna thank Heather, Jenna and Mike, you guys did a phenomenal job. And again, this is a super rare treat. Um, and thanks for your time. Thanks for your great questions, everybody. Yeah, thank you.